Total Laboratory and the Deputy Director of NOVA Fisheries, Northeast Fisheries Science Center. Dr. Brown, MS in Fisheries and Wildlife Sciences at Cornell, uh, MS in Fisheries and PhD in Fisheries uh, at Michigan State University. And he spent the two, last two decades at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, initially as a stock assessment of bi biologists studying haddock and winter flounder. He spent four years as a research <coughs> researcher studying Atlantic salmon and served as the chief scientific advisor for the U.S. delegation to the North Atlantic Conservation Organization. Uh, and he was also the chief scientist on the initial uh, cruise, though the fisheries launched to investigate the impact of the Deepwater Horizon. And this dates us all, well, at least me and Ross. He, the first scientific meeting that he attended was the New York chapter meeting in 1985. So we're happy to have Russ here today talking about resiliency and management in marine fisheries. So Dan and Chris, I really appreciate the invitation to come back here to the New York chapter. Um, my first meeting was in in uh, 1985, and I'm actually going to tell you, hopefully an amusing, but certainly a personally very embarrassing story about my first scientific meeting. Are there any students here that might, this might be their first scientific meeting? Be brave, be brave, throw your hand up. This story is for you guys. Okay. Um, I was an undergraduate, I was a junior at, at Cornell University, and my advisor at the time um, encouraged me to go to the New York chapter meeting, which was my first scientific meeting, and I really appreciate that. Um, I was supposed to meet a group of graduate students down at Fernow Hall, um, and we were to meet at 5.30 in the morning. Um, my work-study job, the drinking age in New York at that time was 19, I was 20, and my work-study job was actually as a bartender at the Thirsty Bear Tavern in the Noise Center. So the university actually had taverns and stuff, and, and I was a bartender. And I worked on Thursday nights, which was the really hot night for that particular bar. And so, uh, I was actually, I was, I actually didn't get off work and get home until two o'clock in the morning. And so I climbed into bed with my then girlfriend, sorry. Um, <laughs> and I was supposed to get up at 4.45 to be at Perno Hall at 5.30. I slept through the alarm, my phone rang, it was actually a telephone, this is pre, pre cell phone, okay. Um, and it was one of the graduate students saying, where the hell are you? Okay, and I said, wow, I overslept, why don't you guys just go? And they're like, nonsense, we'll pick you up at your door. So the van comes up to pick me up. I jump into my dress pants, my only pair. I, I run out to, to meet the van. It's about five degrees. It's icy, and I slip on the ice, and I splay like a deer. <laughs> and I feel this rush of cold air come up my nether region. <laughs> so I get into the van. I'm in the back seat. I've got graduate students on either side of me. They finally go to sleep, so I start probing to see how bad my wardrobe malfunction is. <laughs> it wasn't bad, it was catastrophic. <laughs> I split my pants from the bottom of the zipper all the way around <laughs> the waistband. And it was my only pair of pants. <laughs> So finally the van stops, everybody goes in for coffee, and I'm sitting there in the van, just absolutely mortified, saying, thinking, what am I going to do? Well, one of the graduate students in the van sort of saw me sitting there, and she said, aren't you going to come in and get some coffee? And I'm, I'm about in tears. I really am. Okay? And I said, I said, you know, I split my pants out. I don't know what to do. I'm not going to be able to go to the meeting. And she says, she says you poor dear. <laughs> she said, I have a sewing kit. When we get there, you can go into the bathroom, take off the pants, and stitch them up, which is exactly what I did. <laughs> so, so now, the reason I'm telling this story here, I actually tell this story um, to our students in our partnership education program, which is a, a program where we bring in uh, undergraduate uh, primary uh, minority students to uh, intern at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center. And I tell them this right before they make their first presentation. And my, my comment to them is, if you can get up here, say something meaningful, and sit back down without splitting out your pants, <laughs> you've started your career better than I <laughs> So here's the deal. Here's the rest of the story. That undergraduate advisor who pushed me to go to that meeting was Dr. Uh, 
Charles Kerner. Okay? That woman that I crawled into bed with, her name was Amy Klatnoff. She was a keeper. I married her, and we've been married for 28 and a half years. And that graduate student who took pity on me and gave me her sewing kit, you know her as Dr. Ellen Marston. <laughs> science um, that's used to inform fisheries management uh, for marine populations on the East Coast. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about resiliency not just in terms of the populations, which, but I want to talk a bit in terms of fisheries. So, um, you know, when we think about resiliency, when I think about it, um, it's sort of the scope of, of, you know, a system to sort of maintain population or ecosystem structure in response to natural or human caused perturbations. And when I think of natural caused perturbations, I think in terms of weather conditions, maybe we have a, a decadal sort of effect, uh, which you know, some of our previous speakers talked about. Um, for me, working in the marine ecosystem, you know, something as, as catastrophic as a hurricane or a tsunami. Um, and then when we think about human caused perturbations, we're really more thinking in terms of uh, exploitation or overfishing, perhaps intentional or unintentional species introductions. We saw you know, the, the tragic effects that Dan Josephson had in terms of stocking perch in, in certain uh, watersheds. Um, you know, acid rain or, or something as, as large as sort of um, human-induced climate change. Um, so when we think about this from sort of a population or an ecosystem perspective, um, a lot of sort of the metrics that we take a look at are, are things like spawning stock biomass. Um, fishing mortality rate, right? the exploitation, how are we over exploiting a population, are we under exploiting a population? Um, the recruitment and reproductive success. Is the population you know, continuing to sort of regenerate itself and, and things like that? Um, one of the features of, of marine uh, fish stocks, and at least the two that I'm going to talk about, um, is that they have highly variable recruitment. Um, so we see you know, strains of, of recruitment failure, and we see, you know, extraordinarily, you know, strong year classes that might be 20, 30, 50 times um, the average uh, year class. And then species uh, distributions and, and interactions and things like that. Um, where we're sitting in the, in the Northeast Continental Shell, um, we have survey systems that allow us to basically look at, at shifts in species distributions, and we're absolutely documenting um, shifts in, in species distributions, not just northward or eastward, but also um, relative to water depth. And when we take a look at sort of an ecosystem perspective, we're really talking, thinking more in terms of what are the predator-prey dynamics? Are, are those dynamics stable? Or are they shifting over time? Um, and then, uh, this was alluded to previously, but um, how, does, how does sort of the whole energy flow within the ecosystem work? Um, and we've seen instances in the continental shelf and we certainly, I think, have seen this in the Great Lakes, where there have been shifts from, say, a, a demersal uh, sort of based energy flow to more of a pelagic based energy flow and back again. Um, one of the things I really want to bring home, and I, I, I'm not sure I may be the only speaker who will do this, is to talk about resiliency in fisheries. So when we think about fisheries, um, we're not just talking about the populations of the ecosystems. Uh, we're talking about the folks that, that rely on those resources for uh, commercial and recreational catch. We're talking about the shoreside businesses. I deal with a lot of commercial fisheries. Um, talk, you know, we're thinking in terms of the shoreside businesses in terms of everything from the guy who supplies the ice or, or the, uh, you know, the net shop that provides the nets and things um, to the processors and the distributors and the truckers and things like that. Um, and so, um, when we try to think about sort of resiliency in, in fisheries, we try and think beyond sort of the fish populations to really think about the, the whole system itself. 
Um, I'm going to use two examples today to, to try and push some ideas forward. And my goal here is to really get people sort of thinking uh, maybe a little bit outside of your box in terms of um, you know, how we can apply resiliency in, in a little bit broader standpoint. Uh, the, first, uh, the first resource I'll talk about is Atlantic Sea Scallops uh, uh, fishery. It's a limited access fishery. It's, it's pretty much a single species. Um, they have really limited bycatch issues, but they do have bycatch issues associated with yellowtail flounder and some other species. Um, and it's an example of sort of the successful management of both the resource and the fishery. Okay. The second example I'll talk about is one um, where I was actually the stock assessment biologist when I first got to Woods Hole um, in 1994, and that's, that's Haddock, and I'll talk specifically about the Georgia Bank stock of Haddock. Um, we've had very successful management of the resource. The resource is um, at or near an all-time high in terms of abundance and things. Um, we have very significant bycatch issues associated with this species. It's hard for our fishery to go out and catch this, catch this particular critter without getting bycatch of other critters um, where we have much more stringent regulations. So there's a lot of remaining challenges relative to harvesting uh, the available resource of haddock. And in fact, um, in the last five years, the fishery has only managed to harvest uh, between 15 and 28 percent of the available quota. Um, so I know everybody thinks that you know all the New England fisheries are, are overfished. This is one that's underfished. Um, so when we think about <laughs> fisheries focus in, in management um, in sort of the metrics, uh, as I talk to harvesters, as I talk to uh, the folks that are running the big companies that are sort of doing the marketing, um, they're really looking for sort of a consistent and predictable supply. So they don't want to see the quotas going up and down, and, and they call it the yo-yo effect, and it makes it very hard to plan from a business standpoint. Um, they want to see some uniformity in product. Um, and it's surprising, you know, we, as, as fishery biologists, we always want to manage for a broader size and, and age distribution in the population and having those larger older individuals in the population are, is, is considered to be a, a very good thing um, relative to uh, reproductive stability um, and certainly when we're managing for recreational fisheries um, in terms of trophy fisheries and things like that. When you get to the commercial side, what they want is sort of a universal product, okay? So, you know, one of the real eye-opening conversations that I had probably 20 years ago with one of the processors is they basically said, we don't want big flounder. We want flounder that are this size that fit on a plate. <laughs> you know? and, and as fishery biologists, we don't always think in, in those terms. The other thing I'll point out is, it, at least with our fisheries, it's not just a domestic market. It's a, it's a global market. Um, and I'm going to point out sort of, um, I'll point out an example of where something that that, uh, that you really wouldn't think would affect U.S. scallop fisheries has in a major way. So our success with uh, with scallop management is is frankly accidental. Okay, um, back in 1994, right as I came to the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, we closed these three uh, large areas. Uh, two of them on George's Bank and one of them in southern New England, and they were actually designed to protect two groundfish species, haddock which were at an all-time low, and, uh, and, went, and uh, yellowtail flounder. Well, what happened over the course of, in, you know, what happened over the course of five years is the scallop resources built up inside these areas to the point where the scallop resources inside of these two closed areas were worth more than the entire ground fish resource on the entire bank. And, and what happened after that is, is that we basically um, transitioned to a rotational management sort of system. Okay. Um, a little bit more about the sea scallop fishery. It is a limited access fishery. There's about 120, 130 vessels that have permits for this fishery. Um, the last time I saw one of these permits uh, actually sell, I believe it sold for $2.4 million. Um, everybody who has a permit is, is basically a millionaire. Um, it's one of the three most valuable fisheries in the United States, uh, depending on the given year. So the three valuable fisheries are American lobster, which is also in, in my region, 
Pacific Cake and Atlantic Sea Scallops. New Bedford's been the number one fishing port by value um, for the last 15 years, and that has absolutely been on the strength of, of scallops. So this is a very valuable resource. The dock prices uh, prior, previous to 2011 were on the order of $7 to $11 a pound for the meats as they hit the dock. Um, that shifted after 2011. It became even more valuable. Um, you know, I'll tell you why in a second. But um, this, is, this is a resource where we have tremendous, tremendous data sources. Um, we have a, a sea scallop survey that we've been doing since the 1970s, a, a dredge survey that we do on a research vessel. Um, and we've recently uh, starting to transition to uh, a towed vehicle that basically um, photographs the bottom. And so we actually have a visual survey. And that, that, uh, that system is called HABCAM. We developed it in conjunction with the Wittola Oceanographic Institute. Um, and we're able to tow this particular package across the bottom at about six to seven nautical miles an hour, which means we can survey uh, transects on the order of uh, 1,100 to 1,300 nautical miles annually. So we get a tremendous amount of information. In addition to that, the New England Fishery Management Council set up what's called a research set-aside program. And so they take, uh, I believe, 3% of the total scallop quota and they set it aside uh, to use to, to, to fund uh, research basically and that actually produces about 14 to 18 million dollars annually that's targeted for um, scallop research and, and management and monitoring um, if that doesn't look like a big number to you I'm going to move back to New York State because um, that's a, it's a big research program so I talked about the, the price of scallops and how it jumped after 2011 well in 2011 uh, we had the, the Japanese scenario so what does that have to do with scallops um, the fact is, when you look at the global market for sea scallops, um, there's basically three major fisheries. Um, there's one in Japan that's both a wild harvest fishery um, and an aquaculture fishery. Um, there's one for weather vane scallops uh, in, in Alaska, and then there's the, the fishery off of our coast. Um, what the 2011 tsunami did was it destroyed, pretty much destroyed the entire Japanese fleet and it also destroyed um, their scallop grounds. And as a result, they basically lost the worldwide market for their product, and the United States was able to basically acquire that market. And when we talk about resiliency, I, I haven't thought about it until, until last night relative how resilient is this particular fishery um, where they basically lost their markets now. They still have their, their domestic market and things. Um, but nobody probably foresaw that a tsunami was going to wipe out a fishery. So, um, in terms of sea scallop uh, marketing, uh, size does matter. Um, the fact is, um, the way that they measure sea scallops is basically count. So, you know, 40 count means you've got 40 scallops to a pound. Uh, you know, a U10 count is basically you have less than 10 scallops making up a pound. And so, actually, from a marketing standpoint, you can actually grow these things too large. Um, so, sea scallops are actually capable of, of making uh, quarter pound meat. So you take a you take a quarter pounder and you, you make it smaller and deeper, and, and that's the size of the scallop. And, and you would use a, a steak knife probably to cut it and eat it. Um, but the fact is, there isn't a, a strong market out there for it. So um, the reality is. Um, from a marketing standpoint, what the, the market wants to see is these uh, 10 to 20 pound or 20, 10 to 20 count scallops. <coughs> Previous to sort of this light rotational management, the majority of the fishermen were, were harvesting 30 to 60 count scallops, so they were harvesting the animals at really young ages. By by reverting to sort of a rotational management, we monitor. We basically use the surveys to monitor incoming recruitment. So we see a good set of scallops. We close that area, we continue to monitor, and then we basically allow for a surgical harvest of those animals when they reach the right size. And, and by doing that in a very controlled manner, we make sure that we don't over-harvest the resource, and we're actually providing a product to the industry uh, in a way that optimizes the profit. So again, um, 
very strict limits in terms of area access, trip duration, uh, and crew size. All of the product that's captured uh, in a particular fishing trip is processed at sea. So a typical pattern for a scallopper fishing inside a limited access area will be to deck load uh, the vessel. This happens to be a research vessel, but the commercial vessels do the same thing. As a matter of fact, that yellow object there is, is our half cam toad, um, uh, toad system. Um, they would deck load the system, they would basically deck load the vessel and then basically shuck out the product. Um, and so they're actually limited in terms of the number of crew that they can take to sea. Um, but these trips can be extraordinarily lucrative. Um, they, can, they can gross in the order to $200,000 to $480,000, I believe is, is the current record for a 10-day trip. Um, and that means the crew share. I mean, the guys that are basically handling the gear and chucking the scallops can be as high as twenty-two dollars to $24,000 for a 10-day trip. I'm not sure what graduate research assistants are supposed to do. But I, I will mention that those folks work very hard for that money. They're basically working 20, 21 hours a day. So let's shift gears. We've, we've heard several references to cod. Cod's on the top, but I'm actually going to talk about haddock. Haddock is on the bottom. They're both gaddits. Um, and the thing about haddock is, is they really sort of define the, the history of the Northeast fishery science. And I'll explain that in a little bit. Oops. So this is actually a picture from the 1968 presidential campaign. Um, and that's Hubert Humphrey with his arms crossed. He's actually at the Northeast Fishery Science Center. And the guy to his right is a very young um, Ted Kennedy. And the guy to his left is, is our, our laboratory director, Herb Graham. And uh, you know, this is sort of a classic picture. It's the last time anybody important showed up in Woods Hole. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I will mention that I'm pretty convinced that everybody in this picture is dead. Um, but what I don't want to let die, actually, is, is this. Um, even back in 1968, we were talking about sort of the history of Attic. So that's actually the display we didn't capture. The picture didn't capture it completely, but we actually had a display relative to Attic. So we have a, a tremendously long-term uh, data collection system for haddock. We actually have a catch and age that extends all the way back to 1931. Um, so these two swarthy individuals at the, at the top of the screen are actually sampling haddock on a, on a commercial vessel back in 1938. And the sketchy guy in the, in, the, uh, in the watch cap is actually me digging a haddock or digging an ovalist out of a, a haddock in 1998. So we've had this sort of continuous um, time series of catch and age. We also have research vessels, standardized fishery independent research vessel surveys um, that extend from 1963 until current. And that gives us a very good picture of what's been going on with this particular um, resource. So here's a picture of sort of what's happened to Haddock since the 1960s. Um, we actually had an exceptional year class um, that was recruited to the fishery in 1963. Um, and as it happened, we also had the distant water fleets, uh, primarily from, uh, from uh, the USSR, from Spain, from Poland, uh, were here probing our shores, and they actually came here to fish for herring. Um, but they were catching so many haddock in their pelagic herring trawls that they went back, um, came back with bottom trawls, and basically affected this extraordinary harvest of, of Georgia's bank haddock in the mid-1960s. And this basically resulted in the, in the collapse of the stock. Okay? There were a couple of strong year classes, you know, moderately strong year classes in the 1970s, and you see some resurgence in catch. Um, but largely the population has collapsed for, for quite a period of time. If we sort of take a look at, at sort of catch versus fishing mortality, and, and, and here we're going all the way back to 1931, we see this period of, of sort of relatively stable um, catch of uh, relatively, if I showed you the recruitment, the recruitment would look relatively stable um, for a 30 or 40 year period. But then we have sort of this destabilizing effect. And this is actually not human caused. It's, well, it started out as a natural event and then turned into a human caused event. But we, we have this large recruitment event which attracted in a lot of fishing, uh, fishing effort, et cetera. And that resulted in basically the, the collapse of the population. So 
here's sort of the history of fishery uh, independent surveys. So when I first started assessing the, the stock, um, this, this graph looked very different because um, you know, the, the high point was basically this 1963 year class, um, which showed up you know, very strongly in the, in, the, uh, in the fishery independent surveys. Um, but what's happened since is basically this, this dramatic sort of rebuilding of the stock um, to, to very high levels, to basically record high levels. Um, if we look at this in terms of recruitment, we can see that 1963 year class is right there. We thought, for most of my career, that this was a once in a century sort of occurrence. And then it happened again in 2003. And then it happened again in 2010. And the thing that we're wrestling with as a science center right now is our surveys are showing this year class. And we, do, uh, we have three or four surveys on it now that are all showing phenomenally high recruitment of HAG. If this, if this recruitment event is actually true, it will destabilize the entire ecosystem out there. So that's one of the things that we're sort of wrestling with. Now, with, with any sort of increase in population like that, we actually see you know, some density dependent effects. And so we're very fortunate to basically have the size and age patterns for this population all the way back to 1931. And so you, you see sort of a, uh, I would call it a period of stability here in the, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, you see this sort of sharp increase in the size and age that corresponds with the population collapse. Okay, so the densities are low and, and growth rates increase. Um, but what we're seeing recently is these sort of very sharp uh, declines in, in the size and age. Uh, which means that when we have these larger classes, we're going to have to wait much longer um, to actually see those fish enter the fishery. It also means that from a size selectivity standpoint, that they're probably subject to greater levels of discard because they're not growing across that threshold where they're fully recruited into the fishery as fast. Um, and this is, this is an area of we really didn't anticipate the decline in growth that we would see, and it's one of the reasons that our projections for Haddock um, are, are not on the mark relative to what we need for fishery management. So I guess to, to sort of wrap things up, uh, when I think about sort of resiliency in, in marine fishery systems, um, I really you know, I've, I've tried to take sort of a, a global approach, not just to the population, uh, not just to the ecosystem, but to the entire system that's sort of affecting those populations. Um, there are resources out there that aren't uh, as impacted by human, um, human perturbations. Al almost all of the resources that are of value uh, in the Northeast Continental Shelf are, are certainly impacted. They're fished heavily. Um, and they are impacted by human resources. So it's really important to sort of take a global look at, um, at how those processes are working. With sea scallops, we've been very successful um, in terms of managing the population effectively um, because it's, it's basically, sea scallops do move, but, but you know when they settle, they're pretty much in the same area. So you can predict where they are, you can close the area, you can harvest them uh, you know, in, a, in a very optimal sort of way. Um, with Haddock, we've seen a spectacular resource recovery to, to historically high levels, um, but they're managed along with 17 other ground fish, and it's very hard to capture Haddock. And, and we do have some conservation engineering sort of solutions to this because Haddock tend to rise up in the water column when they encounter a bottom trawl, and cod and flounder tend to, tend to go down. So there are some conservation engineering sort of strategies to try and get there. Um, but this is a resource that we're, we're going to be challenged uh, in several ways. One is to try and figure out how to harvest it sustainably along with the other resources that it swims with. And two is to try and understand if this recruitment event is true, um, what sort of destabilizing effect that's going to have on the ecosystem and how should we manage for that. So Dan, I'll stop there. I don't know whether we have time for questions.
Uh, I just brought a couple. Uh, you mentioned bycatch in this groundfish fishery. I just looking for an update on winter flounder um, populations. They've been depressed for a long, long time, but I haven't followed things lately. I'm just curious about that. So, so the question was sort of an update about winter flounder populations. Um, and there, there's three, we manage winter flounder as three stocks, one in southern New England and the mid-Atlantic, one on Georgia's Bank, and, and one in the Gulf of Maine. Um, the one in Georgia's Bank is, is doing reasonably well as an offshore stock that spawns offshore. Um, the southern New England mid-Atlantic uh, winter flounder resource is, is severely depressed. Um, to, be, uh, to be honest with you, uh, and this is my personal opinion and not the opinion of the agency, I don't think that you'll be able to recover that population unless you recover its habitat. Uh, these are inshore estuary spawners, and a lot of that habitat has, has been damaged or, or just you know, not there anymore. Um, so I would be very surprised to see that southern New England mid-Atlantic population, which is the one around New York City, um, recover without, without sort of that recovery of the habitat. Okay, well, thanks much.